Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me tell you a little bit about me and my relationship with the museum, because that will help you to understand why I'm standing in front of you today. Uh, several years ago, we had a centennial celebration of the fact that Georgia O'Keeffe taught at Columbia College. And as part of that celebration, uh, I went to Ghost Ranch with a group from the museum and got to see where she lived, where she painted, and to really stand in the places that she, that she looked at. And it gives you an opportunity to try to put yourself in someone else's shoes and see what that person saw. Now, of course, I'm not Georgia O'Keeffe, so I can't do the kinds of things that she did, but it helps to put you in that kind of mindset. Uh, as a result of that centennial, I also taught a class at the college called The Psychology of Creativity, and that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, I also have, uh, in addition to my PhD in psychology, I also have an MBA. So part of what you're going to hear from me today is that creativity spans a wide range of subject areas. And we have uh, some demonstrations for you today of that creativity in a number of realms, and I, so I hope that you enjoy what we're talking about. Uh, let me say also that for me, the idea of having a PhD and coming to teach at a college, you probably know that when you come to teach at a college, the expectation is that you follow your subject area. So people see me as the PhD in psychology. That's what I do. I, I also now have an administrative role, so I understand the numbers, and I've done this all my life. My mother was a speech language pathologist, and my father was a retail store owner, so you can understand how all the stuff makes sense to me. And creativity in those areas really makes sense to me as being one whole, not two completely different things. So um, let me start by saying we have a guest with us today. We have several guests who are going to do a demonstration for you, and I'll, we'll get to that in just a couple minutes. So the first thing I want to talk about is what is creativity? And if you see what's up there, it says that the idea is that it transcends ideas, rules, patterns, or relationships. So what does that mean, that it transcends those things? Goes beyond. So it's not just how something is done. It's not just the rules of how something do is done. You have to sort of break out of whatever the rules are. It goes beyond. Um, and Marcy Jo, when she comes up here, is going to talk to you about something that we did at the campus recently that really did exactly that, went beyond the rules, and so we can illustrate it. And often what we think of is that it's new ideas, forms, progression, so it's something moving forward. So to me, the discussion of creativity being not just the arts, but also in business is part of that progression and moving forward to think about how that works. And it's also the process by which uh, we display creative ability. There are, I'm sure you know, a number of myths about creativity, and this is a large part of what we spent talking in, early, in the early portion of the class about creativity as magic, you know, that somebody comes along and touches you with a magic wand and you're creative. And if you haven't been touched with the magic wand, you're not creative. And by doing that, we kind of isolate people. Either they are a creative person or they're not a creative person, and they just are like that. It's not that they're, it's something they can develop. And part of what we talked about in this class is that absolutely that it's something that you can develop. So that myth is really not true. Uh, the other thing that we have, and this certainly fits in with psychology, is the notion of creativity as madman. And all you have to do, and I was here for the speech when somebody was talking about Salvador Dali. Anybody ever seen pictures of Salvador Dali? Well, we all think of him as kind of at least looking like and sometimes acting like that sort of madman. And there have been many, many studies that have been done about uh, the correlation between people who have bipolar disorder and people who are artists. Anybody know anything about what bipolar disorder is? So. The, the idea is that there's really something that is crazy about you if you're an artist. And again, I, that may be true about some people, but it's not the, the myth that every artist is crazy isn't really helpful, <laughs> right? Uh, and creativity is fun. Now, go back to when you were a kid, and uh, I love the idea of finger paints. It's just fun and messy. Even at my age, I think it's really a wonderful idea. But somehow, the notion that creativity is just fun. So think about that for a second. And 
when these folks come up and dance for you, you're gonna understand that creativity is a lot more than fun, not that it isn't fun as well, but it represents a discipline and an understanding of what you're doing that is goes way beyond fun. So the childhood idea of what creativity is is not necessarily what the ad adult idea is, and it's something to really keep in mind when we're sort of writing ourselves off as this person is creative and this other person is not. So again, those sort of myths. Um, many years ago, I watched a show on TV um, called 30-something, and one of the characters in 30-something was a business person, and she met um, a significant other who was an artist, and he actually illustrated comic books. And she went to his house and she said to him, oh, I can't draw, I can't do anything like that. And he took what he had done and he turned it upside down so that she could not identify what he had done as a real object from life. It was just then lines and shadows. And he said, now I want you to take a piece of chalk and I want you to reproduce what I have on here and I want you to not look at the object. I want you to look at what is upside down so you can see, just look at the, the space and lines. And she was able to do it, and it really makes people aware that it really is quite different than either you have it or you don't, and that's part of what's important to think about here. Uh, creativity is most often associated with the creative arts, so music and song, painting, drawing, and sculpture. And since I talked about George O'Keefe, I just want to show you this for one second because it's important to think about kind of the range of work that she did. So here are some uh, representations of her work. And if you look at the flowers and you'll see that there are other flowers, the things that she's most famous for are those sort of flowers that look kind of hyper-realistic. You may know that she, um, the, the assumption was made that all of her flowers were sexual and that these were all supposed to be representation of either male or female sexuality. You may not know that when she, that was said to her, she was furious. You know, I guess psychoanalysis, and again, I'm a psychology person, so I will take some of that blame, was very popular at that particular time when she was painting. And so everything went through that lens, and so anything that was done was sort of written off. It must have something to do with sex, because that's, of course, all anybody thinks about, or at least at that time. We, we still do, of course. Um, but the idea was, she said, that has nothing to do with it. That's what I see when I look at something. She was also, of course, in a relationship with a very famous man, and again, that was part of why they made that assumption. But she was very, very angry about that, which is something that I discovered when I did this work on her, and that many people did not know. You know, many people just accepted that it really was that sexual idea, but to her it was not. If you look at the picture on the far side, the pictures of mountains, I stood and looked out her window and looked at exactly the mountains that she used to, for, to paint that picture. And there, it's very different than that hyper-realism of the other paintings that you're looking at. That's the same person painting those things. That's looking at things in a different way. And to me, that's one of the things that's really important to think about, that um, you're sometimes just looking at things in a slightly different way. Um, you have a number of pictures here of this, oops. So you have a number of pictures here that talk about um, from the lake. And again, that's a much more abstract representation. She painted for a long time. She, so she went through different periods of understanding her art and different ways of seeing. And it's important thing in creativity to think about that different way of seeing. Okay, other kinds of creative arts. Photography. Anybody in here do any kind of photography? Can you talk for a minute about what it's like to pick your camera up and how you look at things? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your process?
And, and do you think of that because of the focus of the frame? Is that part of what it is? And how long have you been a photographer? Or do you, do you think of yourself as a photographer? And what got you interested, if you don't mind my asking? Right. That's great. And anybody else a photographer in here can talk a little bit about your process? Yes, ma'am. So do you think also that your relationship to taking pictures in a museum or any place is something that grew up over time, or were you always comfortable taking pictures wherever and not feeling that sense of distance that some other people feel? So I think that's helpful for a, a number of reasons. Uh, people have different experiences with art and with how they go about doing their art. 
Um, my only experience with a camera were little brownie cameras, if anybody really remembers what those were, things were like. And then when I was much older, I bought a much more expensive camera, and I went on a whale watching trip with my mother. And we got into a little Zodiac boat, if anybody knows what those, you know, kind of relatively small rubber boats that you go out. And as we're out tooling around, this gray whale, anybody knows the size of a gray whale? Head comes up, and all I do is move around looking for my camera so I can get a shot. And I realized that for me, that distance kind of ruined the moment for me, but then I'm not really a photographer. I don't know what I'm doing. I was just doing that sort of vacation. I have to have a picture. So I think it's different for different people. You have a craft that's something that you've explored for a long time. And what you're saying about secret shots is something that's very important to your understanding of your art. So it's again, it's different for different people, and I think that that's, some, that's a theme that we're going to talk about, that diversity of experience. So other creative arts, creative writing, drama, film, and dance. And today we have a group of people with us who are going to talk about dance and the creative mind, how creation takes place, and how dance is a continual act of creation. It isn't a product only. We often think about a performance as, or a, photo, a piece of photography as, here's the end result. And my guess is that for those of you who are photographers have gone back and perhaps taken shots of the same thing repeatedly. So it's not really just a shot, it's how you understand the nature of what you're taking the picture of and that you look at that over and over. So if I can bring up Marcy Jo Yankee Clayton, she is the division head of arts at Columbia College, and she's going to introduce some folks to you. Thanks. I just want to start by thanking Dr. Rosenthal. It's a joy and a pleasure to work with her um, as a colleague and now in the capacity of having her as a provost and a leader. Um, I'm new to uh, a new role this year as division head of the arts, which is music, art, and dance, and dance education at Columbia College. And, uh, had spent five years uh, prior to as the dance program coordinator. So I'm a contemporary dancer, a choreographer, and recently in a world that's quite challenging to sometimes face, um, dedicated to mindfulness and compassion techniques and really exposing my pedagogy and how I approach the dance classroom, how I work with my students, how I work with my colleagues, and how I work with big major themes as an opportunity to feel a sense of embodiment in order to feel connected to, to the work so I can affect change in coming from a place of understanding, a place of empathy for human connection, a place of kinesthetic awareness. And at Columbia College, it's important to recognize, and I'm so honored to say that we are one of the only inclusive practices and if, uh, as a dance major, as a four-year program um, in, in the nation. And our curriculum is being examined right now as a model for ways in which we might invite anyone who may consider themselves to potentially be a dancer to pursue a degree at the college level. So that blows a lot of people's minds when I tell them, especially when there's expectations in our society for a dancer, a professional dancer, what she or he may look like and what kind of pedigree or what kind of training they may come from. A lot of us um, may think of the um, pro professional dancer as one who may begin really early in life. Um, um, usually you may, may imagine a ballet dancer um, who is of a certain body type. Um, who has a certain access to dance. Um, there's a sense of elitism sometimes prevalent in our field. And one thing that I really am dedicated to in my own line of work um, is providing access to quality dance education for people who may not have had the ability, um, the body, um, the access, the funds, um, or the support system necessary to be consider themselves to be a professional in training. So you might imagine, what does a curriculum 
in dance look like for someone who may come from anywhere um, to us and others that we support who come from more traditional backgrounds. We really do, like myself, uh, dance since the age of two, competitive dance background. Um, it was also community-centered, so I had a sense of my teachers as peers and peers as teachers, which is where I really learned uh, kind of my foundation of how I situate myself in the classroom. Anyway, uh, that might be another talk, but... Um, uh, just really finding myself um, in this time in my life where I'm listening to a generation um, that we mentioned millennials earlier. I'm, I'm the oldest generation of a millennial, and, and a lot of times I don't really identify with that term. And a lot of my students I'm finding aren't identifying with it either. But maybe use, using the arts and the access through arts education to really um, have a stronger, more diverse a slate of voices that we hear from. So not people who just have had um, the traditional mode of, of training or um, the, the, um, the types of courses or classes um, since a young age. So that those things that might have instilled in someone a sense of artist, I am an artist, and how those things can develop at any time of our life, how the creative potential is there for us and it's within our reach because it's inside of us. And so it's a way of uh, teaching and learning through dance and through art that's much more about um, trying to uncover and unleash what's already there, the potentiality that we may not connect with for some other for some reason or another and really wanting to um, see I see success in the students as when they graduate they have they believe in themselves to be an artist um, they might recognize themselves not just an artist of their own singular medium not one media but or what one medium but but several, and maybe they see themselves as artists as a way of living, as a way of life, so that it doesn't commodify itself with expectations to have a career, a job, and only then would I be become a professional artist is if I get paid to do it. So I'm really seeing success um, through our dance program, through our arts programs, in a way that is much more profound than just a degree to a job, um, that they do get those skills and training, um, but they also come away with so much more, and and with um, really the understanding of what arts can do for themselves, what it has done for themselves, but the benefits and the effects that it can have on communities of people. So how does access then provide a sense of community and an understanding of diversity? And then how might those things in effect change our world? So i um, very privileged to introduce to you two of our strong students, um, Meredith Juhas and Ashley French. And um, they are both honors program students. And for the last two years, Meredith and I have been um, really interested in connecting our, our research interests together in mindfulness techniques as it relates to dance practices and somatic techniques, which is a way of understanding the physiological sense of the body and the connection, connective patterns and the expressivity of the dancer's potential from the inside out. So with our, our curriculum, we work really from a contemporary place outside in, form to function, and conversely function to form. And how those things, you cannot, I can even see the little bit of um, infinity symbol within that, really support um, students from a holistic place where they might be in their body through mind, body, spirit as connected. So I, I um, for the past two years, we've also had the privilege of being invited at the National Collegiate Honors Council Conference. We just got back from there on Sunday, which was held in Atlanta this year. And um, last year, I asked Meredith uh, at the conclusion of our workshop, which is something that we have been instituted at Columbia College for the last nine years to present at that level, what does honors dance look like? Um, and so the last two years, we have been working with uh, a workshop structure. We've invited participants who may not consider themselves to be dancers or movers. Um, it's right in the beginning of the conference, over 2,000 participants, and we get partic participation from all age groups, um, of course, from college age to on to professor, on to retiree, uh, and beyond. And, um, and then we also uh, 
attract people new to the conference um, who may just be like, what is this dance workshop and why am I invited to do it even if I don't consider myself to be a dancer? What is this about? In the program description, it talks about how the dance workshop is about connecting the mind, mind and body and relating to people. And underpinned in our scholarship is a philosophy by Martin Buber, the I-Thou. And it's, uh, the I-Thou concept really is about relationships and how we might form relationships that are genuine. In dance, we're concerned about genuine relationships, yes, for the way in which we perform something and we want it to look truthful. We want our audience to feel a sense of, oh yeah, that's a real relationship there. It's not just something that has been designed in the rehearsal process and implanted in the space as a product for you to see. But in fact, that there's something still really current and alive about the relationship as you witness it in performance. And so how do we get there? How do we remain alive in performance. Um, we can get to a place where we know our music so well, we know our art so well, we know our dance so well, that it becomes an autopilot situation. And that can be transformative. But also something can get really guarded in dance when there is that separation. So right now I would like to um, ask Meredith and Ashley to get into their bodies by getting into this space. And I'm going to tell you just a couple of things, give you examples of what we do with our participants at the National Collegiate Honors Council Conference workshop which was just last week. So you can imagine uh, participation, participants are coming with uh, business suits on. They have some have skirts. Um, some aren't appropriately dressed to be dancing. Um, but we know that, and we're really welcoming uh, people to be where they are. So we're not it's important for me to, to let you know that we're not asking the participants to learn steps. Um, they don't come to us to the workshop with an expectation that they're going to learn choreography or moves or cool things to do at the wedding or the party. But instead, it's an opportunity for them to better understand the uh, processes through which that we delve in and to get them a sense of their mind and body and spirit connected. And the first thing that we do is we breathe. So I want to ask for you all in your own way, um, no one's watching you, dance is no one's watching, um, to connect some movement with your breath pattern. The first connectivity pattern that we learn is the breath pattern. And so this is how we're going to ask, uh, this is what I'm going to ask for you to, to do. Um, we ask participants to close their eyes, and that is something you don't have to do right now, but I'm going to do and the dancers are going to do. And then we ask them to inhale, and as they do, to express something bigger, gesturally. And as they exhale, to come smaller, inward, to fold in. And some participants kept it small, and others were really ready to express and move big. And we ask with the eyes closed, and as you inhale, that your eyes get bigger, so that your expression, you, the world you take in gets bigger. And then as you exhale, your eyes get heavier and you get smaller. So even as you sit there, if you would move a little finger, hands, in any way you wish, try to indulge me for a second and explore body connected to breath. Inhale, bigger, expand. Exhale, close. Inhale, bigger with wide eyes. Exhale to close. So as you do this, a couple of things may happen. You might find some struggle in your breath pattern. Your breath changes. Sometimes you need to interrupt yourself and catch your breath and close it down. And then you can play with it. <sighs> Staccato breath and how might then the actions of the body follow suit. So then there's a yoking that happens with the breath and the body and a concentration or a beginning meditative state, a focus. So we asked the dancers then to um, explore this same concept as they moved through space. So we evolved this practice. They're now moving around one another. 
And then we had them search for one another with eyes closed. Now there was a process through which we went and ex explained this. We built it up so the participants didn't run into each other and feel <laughs> like, what am I gonna do now? So we talked about collisions and how quantum physics might be an idea you wanna think about so that nothing is solid and maybe plasticity. Cars are made of plastic much more now than they used to be. So collisions happen and there's a rubber quality and a resilience there. So the participants end up face to face. And at this point, they did an exercise prior to that they didn't know who they were going to pair up with, but they found one another. When they opened their eyes, they met eyes with people that they didn't know, maybe people who were from a different country, maybe they didn't speak the same language. And we asked them to gaze into one another's eyes. We didn't tell them how long that was going to take, but we waited. We waited patiently. And my partner, who was from the Netherlands, began to tear up. Because as we connected our eyes together, um, we began to just smile warmly and we exhaled together without cue. And it was a moment where I don't know you, but I know you. And so I really felt on a different level, that transformative, that transcendent level, there's a relationship here. And I didn't even have to try. We asked performers then from here, we needed to get them moving again and interacting. We needed to build to a moment where they just didn't spend time with one person, but they recognized the power and the potential to make other relationships form quickly, genuinely, and maybe they didn't even have to say one another's name first, but in a sea of thousands of people at this conference that, wow, there's no stranger here. So their shapes started as mirroring, and this is a technique in dance movement therapy that's really prevalent, how to connect one person to another in a time, in a shared space, shared time, in a presence that they share. And this mirroring usually begins quite literally as if you are staring at someone yourself in the mirror and there's that replication. And then we ask the dancers, you maybe now can disconnect your eyes. And instead of replicating the other person's movement, how might you just remain in their same sense of flow, their same energy length? Maybe it's just about being on the same page, but saying different things, and that's okay. Common ground. With our participants, we started with the idea of available space or negative space so that we introduced the sense of touch from a real organic place and we gave them an option to not touch, to not connect. For some, that may be asking a little bit too much. <laughs> but then the invitation was there to connect, to share weight. And you'd be surprised by how many people were really willing to do that. We spent about an hour and 15 minutes together before we got to this place. So we're really reinforcing it this time, and the dancers are gonna continue, and then you're gonna be seeing a choreographed duet that's prepared um, and choreographed a year ago by Meredith Hugh Haas. And she's gonna tell you a little bit more about where this duet has come from, the creative power. But right now, I, I see this moment as a place of real true creative potential, a place there where um, the mind, the body, the spirit perhaps is really yoked together. And there's a sense of reciprocity of give and take in the real moment. They're communicating together on a very transcendent level without the need to use verbiage. So essentially there's a universality, there's an accessibility to this experience. the moment of possibility is going to then dissolve into set choreography. But it took this process to get to here to prime these performers for an opportunity to share this duet, not only with you, but to allow it to evolve in its own right as it should in performance. Please enjoy here.
so we asked conference participants to then give us a couple descriptive words, adjectives, phrases, really anything that you grasped onto. And some of their responses had something to do with workshop, something they may have heard us say, but a lot of the responses we got were just really rich responses to this duet. So I'd like to invite you, if you have something to share, to provide that for us. Trust. Fluid. Great. Please. Discovery of each other. Nurture. Understanding. Any others? Protection. Protection between the two of them. trust resiliency yeah extraordinary I'm going to ask Meredith to join me up here and just to give you some backstory about where this duet came from it may surprise you um, and then how the level of research and how to go forward from that place to structure this Thanks, Meredith. Hi. <laughs> Once again, um, my name is Meredith. Thank you, Dr. Rosenthal um, and Marcy for this opportunity to present our work. As you can see, CC is very supportive of the student, uh, really developing an artistic voice. Um, as soon as you get there, <laughs> you're dancing, but why are you dancing? And um, I found in the creation of this piece, really made in collaboration with Ashley uh, last year, that I was in a place in my life where I no longer wanted to be possibly at the college or um, in this town. <laughs> I think we all reached that kind of a point of feeling stuck. And I began to kind of tune out my daily life because I was so ready. I was planning um, the moment after I graduated what would happen. And I became numb to my surroundings um, until I started this process of this dance. And it really forced me to uh, begin, like Marcy, <laughs> stated, uh, starting to use some mindfulness techniques to really center myself and to be exactly where my body was 100% of the day. And for me, that first felt like being caught. And that's kind of how this started, being uh, like caught, like if you're running away, someone's just catching you and saying, no, <laughs> you are here. And I found uh, through listening, through hearing, that being here was actually quite extraordinary. So this piece explores those concepts as well as uh, contemporary partnering work, contact improvisation, and just keeps developing as we do it more and more. So thank you for watching. <laughs> And so for time's sake, I just want to make a jump cut to another um, facet of my work, and uh, it's really about access. And so access to the creative potential and through movement, access to movement, access through dance is what you kind of got a gist of um, what we presented. And this is another way of providing access, and this is access uh, to art through experience experiencing it in site-specific ways. So experiencing in locations that are um, not typical. Um, and I'm just gonna keep it this way so I don't keep clicking around. But I wanna to show you all, um, this is a map of our campus at Columbia College. And we um, do a really cool event there called the Columbia College Walking Tour of Dance and Art. And now it is the Walking Tour of the Arts. And um, we're dedicated to presenting arts, the arts in essentially anywhere that they're not supposed to be seen, typically. So that what that does is it shakes up our creative process, yes. But what is thrilling for me is how it has impacted who 
comes to our shows, who, who attends, and through their observation, how they feel empowered through walking these this tour because they feel a sense of artistry their own selves just through their observations and choosing where they view it. So instead of being in a fixed proscenium, watching dance from with that fourth wall there, you know, and, and, and taking it in with a distance, what site-specific work does is it really plays with proximity and in doing so allows audiences to feel essentially more connected to the work. Maybe because it's a space that they see every day, students, wow, I never knew that that was a part of our campus. I walk past that every day and now I'll look at it differently. Or maybe for it's a new audience that's not a part of that space, they can at least see the context and maybe relate to it a little bit. So I'm just gonna go through, it's a very short slideshow, um, uh, just as examples of how, you know, con the concept of framing, you know, we talked to about to the photographers about how framing something is such a powerful thing in all itself and how audiences just through proximity and where they're located um, to the art itself is in a sense giving them an opportunity to frame their world. This is a science building, <laughs> a big tall staircase a woman at the very tip top of a brick enclosure that's very, very loud and noisy and she made it seem delicate inside um, our science building. And that is a group that I began at Columbia College, a group that's dedicated to um, the creative process as an improvisation artist. So not just using improvisation as a means to create something anew, but to perform it. So as an end, improv as an end. And for me, improvisation is that place of mastery where in the, the place of potential where Everything yokes together to see what the material, the creative process is, but at the same time, the potential for it to change. Um, so hopefully you get a sense of what it is to be creative, that there is an accessibility, and that there are people that are really working so hard to build the dance world and to make it a larger, more connected place and a place of possibility to better understand this world we're living in. So thanks so much for listening to this. and. Um, I'll ask Robin to take it from here. So creativity takes other forms in addition to the creative arts, and that's really what I, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. It is the ability to synthesize, but also learn from mistakes. Now, again, most of the time we don't think about creativity that way. We think it's the sort of perfect thing where we produce something that is some piece of perfection. But I would invite you, if how many of you have already seen face values? How many of you have gone through? If you haven't, please go through, because the people who are depicted are not perfect people. They're people. They're people in all of their whatever existence they have. And faces are not perfectly symmetrical. It's worth really thinking about what does that mean? How do people exist? So mistakes that somebody wears on their face, and that's part of what I think is important to look at as well. Um, part of what's important here is also to think about creativity as coming from the ordinary. Again, that goes back to that idea of the myth of creativity as come, something from a magic wand. It comes from the ordinary. It goes back to a strong commitment to discipline. Think about the young women that you saw on stage here. They can't dance without knowing the basics of what they're doing. People do not just come out there and sort of throw themselves around. There's a discipline and an understanding of focus, right? Of, of how you go about it. And that's part of why I ask the people who do photography, how do you go about, how do you learn about doing that work? It isn't just, I pick up the camera and I hold it up and take whatever is in front of me. It's multidimensional, and that's part of what you saw with the dancers. It's part of your experience. And again, technical cre creativity, economic creativity, and artistic creativity really come together. They're not all separate things. I don't know if you heard there was an announcement this morning that Bill Gates is going to build some sort of community in the middle of the desert in Arizona. Anybody just hear that reported this morning? I, there's a very creative but practical mind, and his idea is that he wants to build a sustainable community, which is part of what the whole notion of creativity is really about. 
if we go back and look at creativity and the sense of community, and that's part, part of what Marcy Jo talked about, if you remember, we have a woman named Jane Jacobs who lived for um, 90 years and looked at urban environments, and she's really kind of the beginning of understanding how urban environments work. And I remember when I was in college, somebody talked about the notion of how people lived and the importance of the front porch. And certainly we understand that in that in this area because of how front porches work, but she was talking about urban environments where people sit on the front porch and they're looking at around them to see what's going on in the neighborhood. Is it safe? Are we seeing the people who we think we're going to, that we're supposed to see? So not a big high rise building. Again, if you've ever been to a huge urban environments where you see, you know, 50 story buildings, nobody relates to each other anymore. That's part of why the environment around the buildings gets trashed because people don't really have a sense of community. So that's part of what she talked about. And she said, how do people live and interact with each other and build that sense of community? There's also a writer named Richard Florida who talks about something called the rise of the creative class. And he says, we're really in an, a knowledge environment now, not so much of manufacturing environment. And while that's true, I want you to think of this as kind of not either or, because that's part of the point that I'm trying to make today. It isn't just one thing or another, it's both and. And that's why I said to the folks who are photographers, my experience of it was different. It doesn't make one right and the other wrong. It just means it's different. And how do we think about and deal with that? Um, how many of you know about a planned community in Florida called Seaside? Anybody know about this environment? Have you been there? So how many of you have been there? So you, know, you may know that it was started by two architects who built this lovely cobblestone environment. It's a quarter of a mile from one side to the other. A quarter of a mile is not very big. And they were very deliberate in the way they created this community so you could walk around cobblestone streets. All the, the uh, houses have white picket fences in front of them. But the rule is that each fence must be different. There can be no two same white picket fences. Each one has to have, sometimes they have dolphins, sometimes they have starfish, sometimes just the angles are different. And part of what they're saying is people are different when they're here. This is not a cookie cutter kind of place. I, I was introduced to it because I went there th 30 years ago and it's changed over time. And I was gonna show you pictures of it, but I would invite you to just go, kind of go and look. The whole idea of it was, this is a village that is really self-contained. You can live here, there's a small grocery store, there are restaurants, there are places to buy books. You can do pretty much anything you want there. And when I first went there 30 years ago, you park your car and you never get back into your car for the week that you're there. There's no reason to do that. So you really, it's as if you've kind of moved to this little village and you interact with people. Um, I was just back there about two or three weeks ago and I went into the, um, to, there's a small market that is probably half the size of this room that we're in. And I went up to the deli counter. And the person behind the deli is somebody that I've seen a number of times. But remember, I'm a visitor. They get thousands of people there all the time. And he looked up at me and he said, wow, I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to see you again. And think about what that means. That's a place that I've gone for 30 years. Actually, this is the first time I've gone. In, I went three years ago. This is the first time I've gone in three years. And he isn't just saying it. You see how he interacts with other people. He remembers. That's part of the experience of being in that community. So it's something that they're building, not just so that people will come back. That is their experience of life. So again, I would ask you to look, because these people are trying to build that experience. Again, in terms of both and, it isn't just an urban environment, also a rural environment. And I had the privilege uh, uh, several years ago of living in South Dakota. So I wonder how many of you have ever lived in South Dakota? Anybody know what South Dakota is like? <laughs> Even if you've heard, not just around Mount Rushmore, which of course everybody knows about, it's very, very flat. You, that's right, it's in the plains, it's very flat, it's very cold, in the winter, the wind is just unbelievable. And all those books that you read about Laura Ingalls Wilder using a rope fence to go out to something, otherwise they get lost, get snowblown. It's all true, okay? 
But part of what's interesting, and I didn't really think about it till I got there, is what is it like to live on a farm? Anybody here ever lived on a farm, if, even if you haven't been in South Dakota? What is life like on a farm? How do you solve problems? Right, and most of the time you don't call somebody in the next town and say, come over and fix it for me, right? You fix it yourself. Right, which is very creative, but we don't really think about it that way. So that was part of my, the experience that I had of being there is that you start to understand different environments in very different ways. People are very creative in a manufacturing environment or a small environment where you can't ask people if something breaks down, you have to be able to fix it by yourself. So again, it's a new, a new appreciation, and that's what I mean. Um, I want to show you just a minute of this video from the person who runs our organizational um, leadership program, because she talks about another element of creativity that I think is really important. I'm delighted that Dr. Rosenthal asked me to chime in on her presentation today regarding the creative mind. I'm Dr. Katrina Spigner, and I have the awesome privilege of leading the graduate program in organizational leadership here at Columbia College. And when I think about the creative mind, I think about our students who come from diverse sectors, industries, and they bring a wealth of creativity. But what I appreciate most is their ability to use their creative minds for cre critical thinking, for really delving into uh, the information we share, the classes, the coursework, and thinking about how their unique creativity adds to the robust information, the robust discussions we have, that creative mind that they bring adds to a diverse and inclusive community of learning. And so creative minds have a very specific place in organizational life, in classroom spaces, in workspaces, in families, wherever they are. And I think as practitioners, as leaders, it behooves us to make space for creativity, to open up opportunities for creative minds, to bring to the table the very precious gifts that are contained right here. Sometimes organizations are missing a great wealth uh, in their organizational culture. So part of what she's talking about, again, is that sense of diversity. And again, diversity comes in so many forms. It comes in differences that people have in perspective, just how they experience the world differently. And diversity is really key to creativity because creativity, again, is that, that difference in the way you look at things and the way you experience things. So why do we consider the non-arts, and I say non-arts to mean business and other pursuits, and I actually, of course, I'm, I was trained as a therapist. And I remember that when I first taught, the first time I got in front of a group of people, um, I'm used to sitting in a chair across from people, and I thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to stand up in front of people and talk for this period of time? And then I realized, as I did today, that part of that is part of that creativity of therapy is engaging with the person and engaging in process, just like we engaged in the discussion today. That is part of the creative process. You can't just say to somebody, okay, this is how I want you to change. Here's your homework. Go out and do this. Come back next week. You're going to be cured. It doesn't work like that, right? So part of the creative process is thinking about all of the things that you do in a different way. Unfortunately, we have a very narrow focus most of the time when we think of creativity in the ways that we've been taught, very doctrinaire, very small, limited ways. And part of what I wanted to talk about today was to, to, help, you, to help us all see it differently. So creativity is really everywhere. 
It's in talking with others. It's learning how that person hears and sees and experiences life and in making an art of everyday life. And I don't want to keep us over time except to say, how are you creative? And I mean in the most, again, again going back to that slide, in the most basic sense of the word. How do you th see things differently? How do you turn things on their head a little bit? How do you help somebody else see things differently? And how do you combine and understand things in a way that have not been seen before? To me, that is really the essence of creativity. So if you have not gone to face values, I just want you to think about this for a second. How many different meanings are there just to the term face value? So I hope that when you go in to look at those works of art, you think of all of those meanings of face value because to me, that is one of the most important parts of that exhibit. I would invite you to go in and see if one of those paintings calls out to you because that was the experience that I had the first time that I went. I feel like th that person is somebody that I want to get to know. And I hope that that's the experience he, that you have. And I hope you think about that in terms of creativity because that's the draw, that's part of what Marcy Joe talked about, that sense of creativity as connection to other people. So thanks very much for coming out today and thank you to all of us. Any questions?